Hello and welcome to the September meeting of Integration Down Under. Uh, go through a few slides before we get started. And um, Dan, I think, has got an offer around the API days in Melbourne later on that we'll talk about. And we'll put a uh, email address up there for you to contact. The organizers for Integration Down Under are Martin, Dan, Renee, Wagner, and myself. And tonight's talk is um, by Dan Toomey four scenarios for using an ISE. Uh, so basically he's gonna go through those scenarios for ISE and we'll see that tonight. So let me hand over to Dan. Okay, fantastic. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining the call tonight. Uh, as Bill said, I'm gonna talk about integration service environments which is a fairly new offering in the integration space in Azure. It went GA a few months ago uh, after a very short time in preview. I think it was only in preview for about three months. And it fills kind of a void that we had in the integration space, uh, particularly around VNet integration. And I will go into a bit of detail about that. So I'll talk about what, what uh, ISC really is um take you through a few things of that and then i'll talk about the four different scenarios um that i'm going to use to illustrate how it might be handy uh for you to add to the kit uh so just a bit about me i uh i work for deloitte i uh, used to work for mexia mexia was uh, a small consultancy we probably the best microsoft integration consultancy in australia um, we were good enough that we caught Deloitte's eyes and they picked up the whole team last October. So we now form part of the platform engineering group in Deloitte, Australia. And uh, I'm also a Microsoft MVP and there's, uh, there's a few other boring details about me. If you want to find out, uh, feel free to look me up on LinkedIn and there's my Twitter handle there at the bottom. So I always like to start these presentations by giving acknowledgments to people who kind of help me on the way uh, to preparing it. So Kevin Lamb is a principal program manager at Microsoft and he's actually led the team that's been responsible for getting ISC out there. So he spent uh, a bit of time with me, helped preparing this presentation for, for Integrate, which I gave in the US back in June, uh, making sure that, uh, that all my content was accurate. Uh, so that, thanks very much, Kevin, for all that help. Uh, and Bill, of course, Bill's not only been my mentor for about the past 12 years of my career, uh, but he's also, tonight, he's hosting a virtual machine in his own private data center in his house, which is gonna be um, crucial to one of the demos that I'm gonna do for you to, uh, to demonstrate hybrid integration. So thanks for that, Bill. And uh, you guys probably all know Sandro Pereira. He's been around in the BizTalk space for forever. He's actually earned the name BizTalkpedia. Um, so Sandro, he, he actually presented here for Integration Down Under a few months ago too. And you might know Sandro, he puts out these video um, files with all the icons for Azure and integration stuff. And that at the time I was gonna do the presentation in the US for this, we didn't have an icon yet for ISC and he actually dummied up one for me really, really quick in time to uh, use my presentation. So I like, like to shout out that kind of special express delivery that I got for him for, uh, for doing that. Um, so to understand what kind of space that ISC fills, we need to have a look at what uh, what the integration offerings were uh, in Azure or what they are. Uh, so I'll just go through these pretty quickly. Service bus, of course, is at the heart of it. I, as a, as a consultant uh, for Mexi and for Deloitte, I can't think of a single Azure solution integration solution that we have built for a client that didn't include Service Bus. And that's simply because messaging is just so integral to the to the integration space that you need that. And Service Bus has a very, very robust uh, messaging offering. Uh, of course, we live in a world of APIs. And if you're going to, you know, everything has to expose APIs, that's the way we integrate. Uh, but to manage those APIs, to provide governance, to provide security, uh, to provide exposure and discovery for them and analytics and all other kinds of features, you, you need some a product that will help you do that. And API management is uh, one of the best products I've seen out there for doing that. And that's certainly an, an integral part of, of Microsoft integration. Uh, we're seeing a lot more event-based, event-driven integration because it, with the thing about Event Grid for being able to help you easily build event-driven reactive solutions uh, that work in real time, which is which is great. And Logic Apps, which gives you the capability of orchestrating 
uh, your calls in, in a more sophisticated uh, integration scenario. And as well as that, it also gives you a huge selection of connectors out of the box. So you can connect to just about every kind of SaaS service that you can imagine. And uh, uh, as well as enterprise connectors that allow you to reach down from the cloud to your on-prem services as well. Now, aside from those four pivotal things in Azure integration services, there are other services that we use too, and there's too many of them to list here, but just a couple I highlight is Functions, which gives, gives the ability to run arbitrary code, and Event Hubs, which is also used for event uh, eventing programming, but it's a little bit different than Event Grid in that Event Hubs actually has the ability to replay uh, events. So Dan Rosanova likes to describe it as like a bit of a tape recorder. Now, the, all of these things are managed services that are available to you, and none of these require any kind of network level uh, configuration. But the reality is that we live uh, in a world where you still have to work with, with network, networks all the time. So either you're using Azure services that depend on virtual networks, like for example, virtual machines, or maybe a SQL database, or maybe an app service environment, um, and you need to be able to integrate with those things, or you're going to integrate uh, to your on-prem uh, organizations that have their own networks that you have to be able to connect to. So the good news is that uh, most of these services do support uh, VNet integration. So we certainly have it with Service Bus in the premium tier. We have it with API management, again, in the premium tier. Uh, Functions also offers um, uh, VNet integration. And you should be noticing a pattern here. So uh, VNet integration is not cheap, right? So um, you know, all of these, um, these offerings, you, have to, you can't use a basic. Or a normal tier, like at least with event hubs, it's offered in standard, but uh, you basically have to pay extra to be able to have that capability. Now, event grid is a little bit different because event grid, you don't really provision that uh, in, in a network and there's no tier levels for event grid, or at least not that I'm aware of. Uh, but the way event grid works is that you can, uh, your topics could be service endpoints, for um, example, like storage queues, uh, which enables you to put network level controls over, over that access. The thing that was missing was logic apps. Out of the box, there was no way to integrate logic apps with uh, virtual networks directly. Now you could get around it by putting API management in front of it, uh, and then you know use IP filtering on the um, on the logic apps to control so that only you, you had to go through API management to get to your logic app. But that wasn't really a full uh, fully integrated solution with virtual networks. The ISC is what solved that problem. And, uh, and that's one of the really important features about integration service environments. So probably most of you are familiar with app service environments. Uh, if you're not, just very quickly, app services, it's been around for ages in Azure. It's what allows you to host web apps and API apps and mobile apps. Um, it's, a, it's a platform as a service. Uh, and I think the web apps do offer some sort of VNet integration, but if you really want that absolute control over your network to put you know, your security over it and to have dedicated resources, uh, you go with an app service environment uh, plan, which basically gives you that network and those controls. And then you can connect, uh, you can control how that connects to the internet. You can also you control, uh, connect to your on-prem uh, networks using a site-to-site -site connection or express route. So integration service environment is really just an app service environment for logic apps and integration accounts. So you now have the ability to host those inside of a virtual network and have dedicated resources uh, and, and isolation where you can then put all of the security controls that are network related that you want to, and you have full first class connectivity to other uh, items that require a virtual network. So going through um, the, the main features, I've already talked now about VNet connectivity and what that gives you for an ISC. Uh, private static back outbound IPs. The key word here is private. And I'll explain that in more depth later when I go through one of my demos. Uh, because you're hosting your ISC within a virtual network, if you want to add a DNS server, that means you can now use custom inbound domain names. So you don't have to rely on the, you know, the stock standard domain name that you get with a logic app. Of course, it's isolated, so you have your dedicated compute resources and you have isolated storage, which gives you extra security controls and also 
um, a guards against the noisy neighbor uh, type of situation, where if uh, you know somebody in your particular region is really going bananas with uh, with logic apps, it's it's not going to impact the performance of yours. And it offers a flat cost model, which for some organizations is actually uh, is actually a plus. Uh, generally, with consumption-based computing, we tend to think we save money because you're only paying for what you use. But at some point, I guess, when you're, if you're really, really high use, you're going to tip that scale, right? Where a flat cost becomes more attractive. But even regard, uh, irregardless of that, uh, some organizations just like the predictability of having a flat cost, and they'll even pay more money for that uh, than they would for a consumption-based uh, um, model just because then they can predict their, their costs better. So the deployment model uh, for an ISE is you start out with a base unit and that base unit gives you dedicated resources which are capable of handling approximately 160 million action executions a month. Now that's not a hard limit. If you do 160 million at one, it doesn't stop. It's just, that's an estimation of what they think that it's cap the resources they provide for you in a base unit will be able to accommodate. If you think you're gonna need more, power than that, then what you can do is scale up by adding additional processing unit units, and each one of those adds another 80 million possible executions a month. But with the base unit, you get a standard integration account, which is actually worth, worth a bit right there. Uh, you also get an enterprise connector. Now, in the consumption-based model, you pay more for the actions in, a, in an enterprise connector than you do for any of the other actions. Uh, but you, because this is a flat cost model, you get that connector in there with unlimited connections and executions in there. And we've already talked about how you get VNet connectivity, and you also have redundancy uh, during a recycle. Now, this is this is if you choose the premium SKU. There is very recently been released a developer SKU, uh, and this makes it a little bit more financially accessible uh, to you, especially if you're starting to experiment with this. Uh, the difference in the developer SKU is that you don't get the ability to scale up. So you only get the base unit. Uh, because of that, there are no SLAs and you don't have the ability, uh, you don't necessarily have full uptime during a recycle. There's probably gonna be a bit of downtime with that. Uh, you also, instead of a standard integration account, you get a free integration account, which has a, has a few limitations on it compared to the standard. But you know, this is a great way to get started. You, def you definitely don't wanna use this in production though. It's, it's absolutely not supported uh, for production use. And if you're interested in knowing more about the developer SKU, that, that link there, the bottom of the slide, and I will publish these slides afterwards, uh, is, it goes to a blog article that talks about the new dev SKU. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture, so that, because it's kind of important to understand how that works, to understand what the benefits are of, of an ISE. So if we talk about our standard logic apps, the consumption-based model that we're, we're familiar with, Basically how that works is that that service is deployed to each region in Azure. And within that region, you basically have four components that make Logic Apps work. You have the Logic Apps resource provider, which basically reads the workflow definition that you create in the designer and breaks it down into individual tasks with their dependencies. Uh, and then you have a runtime that actually allows that those tasks to X. So that's the distributed compute workers that are co coordinated to to, to run your uh, run your logic apps. For the connectors, we also have a connector manager and that connection manager stores all the configuration and the certificates and the other security items associated with the connectors that you instantiate in there. And then of course, there's a runtime for that as well. And really what a connector is, it's, a, it's an API abstraction by the open API uh, descriptions. So those are the four components that make up logic apps and they run in your region. So everyone who deploys Logic Apps in that region is basically sharing these components. When you provision an ISE, what you do is in, within your subscription, you create a VNet and that's, that's a prerequisite first. You have to have a VNet and it has to have um, at least four empty subnets in it. And then your ISE is then injected into that VNet. And what the ISE is composed of is the runtime components for your logic app service. Now you'll notice the management components stay out in the region. They're not exactly part of your, of your ISE, but because the runtime components are in your virtual network, that's where all the control is and the isolation and the security. 
So once you have done that, you can then create your logic apps inside your ISE. And provided that you choose uh, uh, actions and connectors that have either a core or an ISE label on it, they will actually run inside your ISE. Now, at the moment, not all of the connectors are available in, to run in an ISE. There's only you know, a, set of, a subset of them. You're able to run all of the connectors, but if you choose one that, that isn't ISE specific, then it's not actually going to run in your ISE. But you can still use them and the logic apps in there. So what does that, uh, that all give you? Uh, because it's running in a virtual network, you then have the ability to connect to other services in Azure that require a virtual network. So you can do your network pairing there. For example, virtual machines, your SQL database, um, maybe an app service environment. All of those things you now have network level connectivity to. Um, and for other services that, that work by service endpoints, that gives you also the ability to put network level controls over those things, things like service bus, for example, or storage. And if you want to do a hybrid integration, you can connect to your on-premises networks by using a site-to-site -site connection or uh, creating express route if you want. So this was a capability we didn't have before with Logic Apps without trying to uh, execute some workarounds. So I'll just talk a little bit about how you create an ISE. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, the first prerequisite, as I mentioned, is that you have to have a virtual network. And within that virtual network, you have to have at least four empty subsets that you've set aside that can accommodate up to 32 addresses. So for CIDR notation, that means you have the slash 27 or less after 27 or smaller. Um, it's no, there's no requirement to use network security groups. And if you do, you actually have to be a bit careful that you don't uh, close off the ports that an ISE needs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. You Optionally, you can add a DNS server if you want. So you can use a, a virtual network that you have other stuff in. It's just make sure that you have four empty subnets set aside uh, before you try to create the ISE. And then creating the ISE is pretty simple. Uh, rather than go through the slide, which will be a handy reference later, I'll actually just take you through uh, that process. So you can all see the Azure portal now. Just want to make yeah. sure you have it. Yes. Yep, you can. Great. Awesome. OK, so if you go to create a resource and you just type in the search screen into integration service environment that comes up. Um, so then you get the landing page, a typical one, which gives you a little bit of a description of what the service is that you're about to deploy, links to the documentation, nice little screenshot here, uh, and a create button. And when you click that, it's uh, you get some very, very standard fields that you see uh, for almost any service you create in Azure, which is, of course, you choose your subscription that you want to use. You can choose an existing resource group or create a new one. I'll just choose that one. Uh, you can give it a name, and it doesn't matter because I'm not going to actually deploy this. Uh, your location. Uh, now, an important one here, and this is also a fairly recent addition, is choosing your SKU. So you can either choose premium or developer, and those are the two uh, ones that I described earlier. So I don't really want to um, blow up my subscription, so I'll just choose developer for this. But if I chose premium, actually I can do it anyway, uh, you'd have the option to decide from the get-go that you want to scale up this ISE. You might decide that a base unit is not enough. You want to have maybe a, a couple of extra scale units added as well. So you can choose that if you want uh, from the beginning. This access endpoint is also uh, something that's pretty new. You can choose internal or external, and all of that has to do with how your logic apps are going to be exposed. So if you choose external, it means you'll be able to call them from outside the virtual network. But if you choose internal, it means you can only call them from inside. So if you're doing a hybrid solution and you only and you don't want them exposed externally, you want them only accessible within the network, you would choose internal in that case. And then the last bit, of course, is the virtual network. Now, uh, I forgot to mention when you create your virtual network, it has to be in the same subscription and region that you want to create your ISE. So when you, uh, when you uh, tick this drop-down menu, it's only going to show you the VNets that are in that region and that subscription. 
uh, and you will have to have created your subnets. And if you if you haven't, you'll get this error that says, "Hey, we need four empty subnets." Um, you know, in order to do this. But the nice thing is, you get a little bit of the link here that gives you the ability to create those subnets at this point if you want to. And uh, after you've done all of that, you just simply hit the review and create. It does a little validation, and then um, and then starts deploying. And you can go for a nice long coffee break, and I mean long. Uh, because it will take about an hour and a half uh, to provision this. That sounds like a long time, but when the preview came out, it was about three hours. So um, that's actually that's actually pretty good. Um, and when all of that finishes, then what you get is an ISC that looks like this. So this is the one I've uh, that I've already provisioned. And uh, this is the overview screen, which uh, lets you know how much of your processor power and stuff that you're using and your uh, typical metadata about it. Uh, and you then, if you, uh, if you want to create anything in it, like a logic app or an integration account, uh, your API connections, you can go there and simply add them uh, from here. And this is the way I would highly recommend that you create your logic apps within the ISE, is go into the ISE, go to logic apps, and then click add here. Uh, you still could go through the create resource menu, but the, the danger is that, um, and I'll show you why, what that does. I'll just get out of here. Yep, all of that. Um, so we don't do that. If I go create resource and I choose, oh, what's my mouse pointer doing? Hmm, maybe I have to close this first. Create a resource. Okay, that's why. Is open. So if I go with the logic app, um, the very important thing about uh, creating your logic app is if you want it to run in your ISE, in the location menu, you need to choose the integration service environment as the location, not the region. If you choose a region, it's just going to run out in, in normally in, your, in, your, in the region, but not within inside your virtual network. So you have to choose that. It's easy to miss that. I've done it. Uh, and then wondered why my logic apps couldn't connect to my uh, network resources. So, um, you know, the safest way to probably do it is just create it within, within the ISE itself. So with that, I'll go back to the slides now. Um, there we go. You should be able to see the slide again. Okay, so uh, I go through that process of uh, creating the logic app. So that's a handy reference for you when you download the slides. And now I'll get on to talking about uh, when you want to use an ISE. What are, what are some scenarios that make this worthwhile? Because let's face it, this is not a cheap, um, uh, a cheap offering. Uh, there are obviously many scenarios that, it's, uh, that, would, uh, that would be useful for an ISE. I'm just going to cover four of them in this presentation. So the first one is a situation that we actually had with one of our clients a few years ago. Uh, I mentioned before about the static outbound IP addresses and the fact that they're private. So logic apps out in that normal consumption based logic apps do have a set, uh, a fixed set of outbound IP addresses, which you can discover and you can use. Um, so if somebody um, you know, wants to know what IP addresses you're going to be sending their FTP file on, you can give them that set and that's fine. The problem is that anybody else who uses connectors in logic apps in that region is also using those same IP addresses. And we had a client where they wanted to send FTP files to a vendor and the vendor said, we need to whitelist the IP address that you're sending it in. We need to know it's coming from you. And that's where we kind of fell down when we wanted to use logic apps because at the time we couldn't promise them that anything that came from one of those IP addresses actually came from our application because anybody else who had deployed uh, connectors in that region would also use the same IP addresses. So the benefit of using an ISC is that those connectors are now running inside the subnets of your virtual network. So the outbound IP addresses are, are specific and exclusive to your virtual network, which means you can actually put your hand on your heart and say, yes, if you get uh, a, a file, uh, a message from this IP address, it's definitely from my application. So the first demo I'm going to do is just kind of show you a little bit how that works. Um, and I'll just uh, cut over to now here. What I've got is inside my ISE, I've got this logic app deployed. It's a very, very simple one for a demo only. Um, just to basically take in an HTTP request 
and to send out uh, send it out as an FTP file. Now, the first thing I want you to see is that you see this core badge here. Uh, that badge, as I mentioned before, is the sign is a signal to you that this is running inside your integration service environment, right? So it's isolated that way. Now, the create FTP file also is running inside the ISE, but there's a little bit of a, I think it's a bug actually, it doesn't actually display the badge, but I can prove to you that it actually is because I chose this FTP here, the one that says ISE under it, and I chose create file, which also has ISE on it, uh, but when I actually select that, it doesn't show the badge here. So take my word for it, uh, this is definitely running inside my, uh, uh, my ISE. So again, very, very simple logic app. Now this create FTP file is using a connection called FTP one. And if I go to that connection here and show you that FTP one, um, we'll see the details and it is connecting to this server here uh, and it has the credentials for it. So that server is a virtual machine that I've provisioned out in Azure. And it's um, it's not part of my uh, it's not part of my virtual network at all. Okay, it's outside that network. There's the same IP address that's there. And on this virtual machine, I've, I've configured FTP, so I've got an empty in directory here. And what I'm going to do now is simply invoke that logic app. So let me just get out of here. I need to go back to the designer and copy that URL. So just copy this and then we'll go to Postman, favorite tool for calling APIs. I'll move that over here, there we go. Uh, and I'll paste in the, the URL, okay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna send a little bit of XML over and, and that'll become a, a file. So we'll go ahead and send that. Now there's no response. I haven't uh, configured the logic app to send any response. So I get an empty response, but you can see I get a status of 202 accepted. And if I go back to my virtual machine, I now see that I've got a, a file in the inbox and that file contains exactly the message that, that I just sent in Postman. Now, none of you should be impressed with that because this is like Logic Apps 101. You could do this four years ago <laughs> very easily. But what I want to show you is that, uh, is the IP address that that comes from. So I'm going into my logs here and I should have, here at this time, so at 9.31, we can see yep, that's that's the time here on the local time on that machine anyway. And we have the client IP address and that here is this IP address, which is 1372, uh, 231.119. Uh, now just give me a second here because I need to do something else. Um, I forgot to, always forget to launch Visual Studio Code, don't I? <laughs> which is, all right, let me put that here. So get rid of all that. All right, so I'm just gonna uh, paste that, that IP address in there. And if we go back now to uh, my ISE, I wanna show you where you can find out what the outbound IP addresses are. If you go into properties, there is a, a property here, which is connector outbound IP addresses. And you have a bunch of IP addresses and a couple of ranges there. We'll just copy that. We'll go back to um, Visual Studio Code and I'll just do a little bit of a replace. Uh, so it makes it a little bit easier to read. Yep. And you can see that the IP address that uh, on that FTP server for the incoming message uh, matches one of the ones that's in the outbound IP. So we know that um, that, that message, that FTP message has come from inside uh, my integration service environment. So that's really the, the what I wanted to show you in that demo. Okay, we'll go back to the slides now. And hopefully you can see that. Uh, yeah, coming on, there it is, okay. Okay, so now the uh, second scenario. Uh, because you isolate uh, with an ISE your resources, then you can get more predictable performance 
uh, which means you're not subject to the noisy neighbor kind of scenario where somebody decides they're going to do 20 billion transactions a minute. Um, you know, in 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 that region, uh, it's not going to affect your your logic ads running if 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 you're worried about that. But the other thing that it does is it gives you the ability to explicitly control the scaling. Now, with let's say, for example, you're a retail business and you're going to have a Black Friday sale and you know that it's going to be exceptionally busy that day. You're going to basically have a click frenzy that begins at eight o'clock in the morning. Now, with with serverless features like Logic Apps, OK, you generally don't worry about scaling because uh, it will scale as it needs to by itself and it and it does it a reactive scaling and you don't have to configure that in fact you you can't configure that it just it just does it uh which is great um but the problem is that if you know that there's going to be a huge amount of hit all at once at a certain time it's possible that during that those those the first minute or so when it's scaling up that you're going to get some issues or some of your clients are going to get issues they might get you know timeouts get knocked back because it's busy so um, if you this, that you decide that you want to guard against that and you want to be prepared and have everything scaled up before anything starts, well, you can't do that with regular logic apps because there's no scaling capability. But in ISC, you do have the ability. You can explicitly control the scaling by simply provisioning more, uh, more units, more scale units. And uh, not only can you do it explicitly, but you can also do it with have set auto scaling on it so that it reacts to a number of metrics. I'd like to actually be able to show you explicitly how to configure that, but because I uh, provisioned a deve developer SKU version of IC, the scaling isn't uh, isn't uh, isn't active, so I can't actually show it to you. Uh, but I do have some screenshots to show you how sophisticated that scaling is going to be. So, for example, uh, if we uh, when you go to the scaling screen, the scale out screen. You basically get um, you basically get always get this default scaling. I don't know if you can see that. It's not actually drawing for something. Uh, yeah, why isn't that not drawing? Okay, whoops, sorry. Um, anyway, here this default um, uh, rule is always there, right? And generally, you'll probably set that to a specific instance count, like one or whatever it is that you wanted to run as the default. Uh, but if any um, if any anything that you add, you any other conditions that you add, if those conditions are filled, those are the rules that will execute. So here, for example, uh, you can scale to a specific instance count, uh, which could be a different instance count, like I could have make that you know five or ten or whatever uh, for a particular scheduled time, and that would be perfect for Black Friday, wouldn't it? You'd just say on this day, I want you to run ten units and not one. Um, so, or you can also say scale based on a metric. And when you select that option, you then create a rule based on that metric and you get a separate dialogue here, which has a very, very sophisticated um, way of, of, of monitoring several different metric, metrics. So metrics based on latency, on the number of messages, on the number of errors, uh, all kinds of things. It's, a, it's actually a bit of a science to work out how to do that. So I've included this link here because uh, you kind of need to, to read it to understand how, the, how to work those scaling settings because they're actually quite complex. So there's a fair amount that you can do in an ISE, and you can't do any of this with normal logic apps. It will scale automatically, but it is a reactive scaling. So if you get a sudden surge uh, of people, it you know it could, for a very short period of time, have some issues uh, with that. Okay, uh, so I'm sorry, I can't show you that demo, um, but I'll move on to scenario three. Uh, and that's support for additional hybrid connections. Now, with normal logic apps, uh, the way we did hybrid connectivity uh, is through the enterprise connectors and something called the on-prem data gateway. So the on-prem data gateway, basically you deploy a service in your on-prem network on any server that's within, the, um, within that network. And uh, that creates an outbound connection, which then becomes a tunnel for logic apps to be able to send messages down. It's built basically on top of service bus relays, if you know how that technology works. Uh, and that works very well, but there's a couple of limitations with it. There's a bit of a size limit on the messages, so you can only send messages up to two megabytes in size. So you'd have to do some chunking if you wanted to send larger messages. Um, and the enterprise connectors, there's only about a dozen of them. Now, they're there for all the big systems like SQL, uh, Oracle, uh, SAP, BizTalk, you know, IBM, a few, few others. 
But if you want to connect to something on prem that isn't represented by one of those connectors, those out of the box connectors, then you have to create a custom connector. It's not all that hard to do, but it does, you know, require a developer team to do that. And maybe you don't want to deal with that. Or maybe you just want to have uh, network level controls. So that's what um, that's what the ISC gives you is because you can now just basically join uh, the network using a site to site connection or, or an express route. And then, you know, your connectors will just will just work. Uh, so you can use connectors that that otherwise wouldn't work in a hybrid scenario like a FTP or SMTP. Or you can just literally use the um, the built in HTTP action and call your services in your on prem network as if they were as if they were local. And that's actually the demo I'm going to do next. So uh, what I'm going to show you first is the virtual machine that is running in Bill's data center. Okay, so this IP address here, 150.101.1561 is the public IP address uh, for that machine. But, but, uh, but if I do IP config, whoops, IP config. Yep. Okay. We can see that the local IP address is 172.29.0.101. Okay. That's that's the IP address of this virtual machine within the the network that Bill has set up. So Bill has deployed this inside a network which is connected to my ISC uh, virtual net virtual uh, virtual network uh, through a site to site uh, a VPN gateway. So it's a site to site connection. And on this machine, uh, I've got a very, I've got a simple web API uh, that's that's deployed there. And if we want to see what that looks like, um, just bring up, go back to Visual Studio Code. It is a very simple web API. It's literally a hello world. Uh, you pass in, you know, a, a URL with a token, with a name in the token, and it spits back that name at you. And it also, uh, just for shits and giggles, sends since back your the IP address of uh, where you're calling from. So I have a logic app that makes use of this this web API, and it's very simple. You call that you call into that uh, with an HTTP request. Uh, it then uses the built-in HTTP connector uh, to call out, and you see that IP address 172.29.0.101, which is uh, which is the local IP address for that virtual machine uh, that Bill is hosting. And then, you know, whatever response comes back, it just sends back the response in there. Very, very simple. Um, so I guess the next thing we do is we exercise that. So if I go to back to Postman. Uh, oops, I forgot I have to get the uh, URL for it. So we'll grab the URL here. Make sure I actually got that. And paste it here. Um, and this is actually a good opportunity for you to see how Logic App URLs work, by the way, when you expose them. So it uses shared access signatures. So you can see the signature is here uh, as a parameter. It also you know, it specifies a couple of other things like the API version and stuff. Uh, I'm missing one key, though. I have to give it a parameter uh, called name. Uh, and that name, I'll just put my name in there to start with. And uh, we'll, we'll call out to that Logic App and see what we get. We should get a response. There it is. Hello, Dan. And your IP address is 10.1.1.5. If we went back to the Logic App itself, uh, and if I looked at the, uh, yep, succeeded. So 7.42 PM, that's the time now here in Queensland. So we can see that that succeeded and we got that call through uh, that Logic App. Now that IP address that came back, Let's just copy that for a moment because I want to show you something about this. Go back to Visual Studio. Um, if we look at that, we would expect it to be in the outbound connector IP address range. But if you notice, it's not. So why is that? Well, let's just go back to our ISE. And uh, here we had the, uh, the connector outbound IP addresses, but we also have the runtime outbound uh, outgoing IP addresses. Now, uh, the core connectors are the built-in connectors and they actually work in this in a different subnet. They work in the Logic App subnet, which is using the runtime IP addresses. So if I copy that list 
and go back to here, paste it, run my little um, thing, we'll see that actually that IP address does fall in this range here. So if you don't understand CIDR uh, notation, uh, that's basically giving you uh, 32 addresses starting from here. So from zero to 31, they're in that number and, that, and certainly five falls in that range. So um, that's, that's why that IP address is different than the outbound connector ones. But what we've just shown you is that I've made a call from my logic app in, in a virtual network to a, uh, a web API that's hosted on a machine in a connected virtual network through a site-to-site -site connection uh, using the local address, uh, not the public uh, external IP address of that service. And I was able to call down to it. So that's a hybrid scenario there. Okay. And uh, scenario number four uh, is basically, this is when your enterprise um, basically wants to lock everything down using network level security controls, uh, where everything has to be controlled with, with NSGs, for example. Uh, that becomes pretty difficult with standard logic apps because they don't run in the context of a virtual network. So that, be, that makes that difficult. Um, now, how would you, how do you secure normal logic apps? Well, we, we kind of just showed you that already that we have shared access signatures, which is a very standard way of, of doing security um, in Azure. It's used on a lot of different components. You also have the ability to restrict incoming IP addresses. So you can lock that down for, for the, a trigger endpoint for a logic app. And uh, with uh, API management in front of it, you can also use uh, things like OAuth and Azure Active Directory. So there are a number of ways that you can secure normal, um, normal logic apps, but not with network level controls. That comes with the ISC. So you get all of the above, plus you can use network security groups. Now I did mention before that when you create the virtual network to host your ISC, you don't need any NSGs, it's not a requirement. But if you put them in, you have to make sure that you don't block any, um, any ports that really are required to be open for the ISC to work, otherwise it's just going to stop. Um, so to understand what all those ports are, and there are quite a few of them, uh, you can go to this link and it gives a very, very detailed list of it. Uh, but I'll also show you uh, another neat little feature about ISC is you get this network health page. And when you click that, basically it, it, it goes through your ISC and makes sure that all of the ports are open and it gives you, you know, a health status on all of that. So you, sh you can see that three of the, three of the four subnets I've, I've used are being, uh, uh, I've provisioned are being used. The fourth one would probably be used if I introduce some extra connectors, like maybe some um, uh, enterprise connectors or something. Uh, but it also, for each one of those subnets, it tells you what's in there and what ports need to be open to, and for what services. So you can even see that within your ISC as well. And you learn right away if one of them is being blocked. So at least that gives you a little bit of help there. Okay, going back to the slides. Sure, why that's not coming up. There we go. All right, um, and this, uh, I don't have a demo uh, for this uh, because it'd be pretty hard to demonstrate that, but um, here's just a little bit of an architecture diagram that comes from one of the Azure solution blueprints. And you can see that um, this has got a, a, a network and a whole bunch of different segregated network security groups where different things reside. So your, you know, your application gateway, your API management, an app service environment, and also an integration service environment. So now what you can do is your full integration solution, including your logic apps, can now be hosted and controlled inside the security of a virtual network, which is something we couldn't do before. So just a few caveats and, and tips. Um, uh, ISCs are available everywhere that logic ops are available, except uh, for these particular regions here. Uh, so the US government cloud is coming pretty soon, I know that. And actually, I think the West Central US is, is available because I'm sure that I saw that in the location dropdown when I was uh, playing around the other day. So that may have just come online very recently. The rest will follow soon though. Um, I've mentioned already when you're creating your VNet that you know it has to be in the same region and subscription of where you want to host your ISC, uh, and it uh, it requires the four empty subnets. 
uh, in there. Now, if you're like me and you decide you want to play around with this, probably you're going to go out and provision a virtual network just for this. And then you're going to go ahead and try to provision your ISC. And you're going to be a little confounded if uh, when you go to that virtual network drop down, you don't see your network listed there. And this will be even if you, you know, the, I mean, the first question you'll ask is, did I deploy it in the right subscription and region? But even if you did, it may not be there. Uh, I just found that I had to shut down Visual Studio, uh, sorry, sorry, shut down the browser and re-log in, and then it would eventually appear in there. So it seemed to be a little bit of a delay or some caching going on there. So just give that a try if you get, uh, if you get stuck with that. Um, if you make any changes to your virtual network after the ISC is deployed, you might have to restart the ISC to, um, to pick up those changes or, or to start working. So uh, the good news is it's easy to do. It's just a little restart button there right on the overview page. Uh, the bad news is it can take several hours uh, for it to do it. But the good news is if you've provisioned a, um, a premium plan, it, there'll be no interruption to your services. So it's, it's resilient. Uh, your logic apps and all will continue to run during that restart process. If you did the developer SKU, there's no guarantee. Um, but I have to tell you that I did do a restart uh, a few nights ago on my developer one, and at least when I was testing, the logic apps kept working. So there may have been holes or periods that it, it stopped working, which I just wasn't testing. But, uh, but anyway, be aware that with a dev SKU, you don't have an SLA on that, but you do get one with the premium. So um, one of the biggest things you have to consider with an ISC is the, the cost benefit analysis between the consumption base model and the fixed price model, which is the ISC. So with the consumption base, it's obviously it's paid for what you use. Every action that executes in, in your logic apps, and that includes when it goes through loops, by the way, or triggers that are recurring triggers every time it executes, whether or not it picks up any data, that, that does, there is a charge for that. Um, you pay for what you use, um, which normally is, is pretty economical unless you're doing billions of transactions a month because there comes a point where it's a tipping scale where you know, a flat price might actually be better. So as you start pushing a million transactions a month, uh, you're probably going to do better economically with the fixed price for an ISC, which gives you 160, uh, sorry, when I said, did I say a million? I meant more like 100 million. Um, with an ISC, you get 160 million uh, actions at a fixed price. Um, the other thing to consider is that in a consumption-based model, an integration account is an extra add-on, which you pay for, and you pay a lot for it. Um, it's about a thousand US uh, for one of those for a standard integration account. Um, with the ISE in your base, um, your base scale unit gives you one for free. That's in, that's included in there. So there's some value with that. The enterprise connectors are charged at a higher rate than the normal connectors in, in Logic Apps. But of course, with the ISC, you get one enterprise connector included with unlimited connections. So you're not actually being charged anything extra for that. So those are things to consider. Um, but ultimately, you also need to think about um, you know, the, the other benefits that you get with an ISC, like VNet connectivity and the isolation uh, and, you know, the predictable performance and on all of that and, and the value of that. So it may not necessarily be that you're, you, you have to be executing millions and millions of transactions to make it economical. Uh, you may be willing to pay for those features, even if you have a fairly low level of, of transactions going through. So wrapping up here, in summary, the key takeaways here is that the ISC provides VNet integration for Logic Apps. That was something that we didn't have before. Uh, now, like the other integration services that are on offer, we can have first class um, support for virtual networks with our Logic Apps. Uh, because it's an isolated environment, it gives you predictable and consistent performance that you know uh, protects you from the noisy neighbor scenario. And it now allows your entire integration solution, which can, you know, might include logic apps and everything else uh, that, that's part of that, uh, to be controlled within a private network and all of the security controls that go along with that. Now I've got a slide here with a bunch of links uh, and, uh, and for references. So again, I'll be publishing these slides so that you can uh, make use of those. And as Bill promised, I did want to give a bit of a, a, a shout out to API Days, which is happening in Melbourne next week for two days on Thursday and Friday. So if you can get to Melbourne, that, uh, that's, a, that's a really, really good 
a good conference to attend. Um, and, uh, and Deloitte, uh, who's basically organized the conference, is uh, kind enough that everyone of you who's attended tonight's session is entitled to get a 50% discount, um, which is worth about $200 because the registration fee is $400. So uh, do take a screenshot or whatever this uh, slide if you want, or Bill, I think, is going to send out that email address uh, to you. So you just have to send an email to Pauline and uh, mention that you attended this this uh, the integration down other thing and you got this code from me and um, and she'll be happy to send you uh, a code that you can use when registering uh, for next week and so with I, that i sent that out on the chat fantastic thanks bill uh, so now i guess we're uh, ready for questions okay so there's nothing no questions in the question window so again yeah, thank you very much dan um it's um it is a fairly complex topic. It's one of the new, very new things in the Logic App world. So, but I almost fell off my chair when I priced it out. So <laughs> just be aware of that. We got a couple of questions. So um, ISE Logic Apps can be developed within Visual Studio as usual. Um, can you yeah, deploy I the ARM templates? inside that yeah you should be able to yes i think the key here will be the location so remember how i uh showed you that location you, instead of choosing a region to deploy your logic app you need to choose the integration uh service okay. environment yep. Yep. and i okay, don't yep. i don't actually know what that looks like in an arm template i actually would have to be curious to see how you how you specify that but yeah yep um, I, let's see, express route, you need 0000 slash zero routed to the internet. Why? Hmm. Um, okay, I'm probably not a good person to answer that question. Yeah, I, I haven't dealt with a uh, express route either. Uh, another one, uh, did you face any deployment challenges for ISE logic apps? Uh, so I only deployed through the uh, through the portal. I didn't um, I didn't use uh, use ARM templates or anything like that. So uh, the answer to the question is no. But again, I might not be the best person to ask because I haven't I haven't used DevOps or anything like that to do it yet. And next question: Instance count is this equivalent to spinning up another ISE? Um, and I can answer that no. It's it's like when you um, if you like got an app service plan and you spin up another uh, server for that, it goes into the pool of servers available to service the requests and it's completely load balanced. And if you kind of get, you kind of get an idea from the, from some of the stuff is 160 million um, uh, actions for the base and then 80 million for each unit you add on. So most likely we've got two sets of infrastructure in the base, and then you're adding additional one set of infrastructure as it as you scale it. So I'm not sure what one set of infrastructure, maybe multiple servers, maybe one server, but no, it's um, it's basically um, it just adds more capability that's load balanced under the covers. That's right. And to add to that, with the with the scale units that you add, uh, you don't get another integration uh, account or, or enterprise connectors or anything. You just get the ability to execute more actions. Uh, and yep. they cost each scale unit costs about half the price of the base scale unit. Yep. Um, so John asking ISE needs four subnuts. I only noticed two being used, one for for connectors and the other for runtime. Um, how are the other two subnets being used? So I asked that question to Kevin Lamb, and uh, he said that the other subnets would be used for specialized connectors that require their own subnet. So I, I suspect that some of the enterprise connectors, like maybe the SAP one, um, I don't I don't know exactly how how that works at the network level, but there may be reasons that they need to isolate them to their own subnets. So I'm just doing very basic stuff in here, but you know, with a full-blown enterprise solution, we might find that there's more usage uh, across those subnets. And actually, my demo one is using three of the four of the four subnets. Yep. Um, are the ISC enterprise connectors different from the original Logic App ones? Don't no, think so. No, they're 
they are exactly the same. The only difference is that uh, if they have the ISE badge on them, they will run in your virtual network. But they are the same connectors. Yep. So uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's. I think that is all. Oh, there's one more. Thanks very much for the session. That was from Ahmed. So um, I don't think there's any more questions. So again, thank you very much, Dan. It was a very informative session on the ISC. Um, I'm getting ready to go out to a client tomorrow to tackle all this fun. So we'll see how we go. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Yep. Appreciate everybody showing up tonight. Thank you.